Okay, my next question is from Ballet Love 282 again, and she says, why do professionals wear tights over their leotard? Great question. To be completely 100% honest with you, I have no idea. It's kind of something that just started. I think it's easier instead of if you want to wear black tights rather than wearing the tights under the leotard that kind of doesn't look, it kind of looks like 80s workout kind of thing. Um, but the pink tights, I guess, go along with it. I, I don't know. Um, I think a student kind of look is the tights under the leotard, but it's kind of like, oh, I'm a professional now, I can wear them over. To be honest, I have no idea. That's my take on it. Um, she also asks, um, what's the difference between summer intensive auditions and company auditions? And can you please give some advice to, to doing well in company auditions? I will do a separate video on just auditioning. I have a lot of ideas for that. Um, I, I've already done a blog post on it that I will expand on soon. Um, so if you want to go to my blog, it's called ifthepointyoufits.com. I will link it below that post. Um, but as far as auditions go, it kind of, it doesn't really matter if you're, if this is the summer course or the company. Um, you just want to make sure that you stand out in a good way, as this kind of goes along with the summer course video that I just did. Stand out in a good way. Wear something not bright, you know, like don't wear like neon pink or something, but maybe wear a, a nice clip so they can say, oh, that's the girl with the clip. Or, oh, that's the girl with the red belt. Or, oh, that's the girl in the, you know, royal blue leotard. I would wear some bit of color somewhere on you. I still look very, very professional. Pink tights, um, leotard. If it's a company audition, you might be able to wear whatever color you want. Uh, the summer course tends to be, it's a good idea to wear black and pink. Um, but I'd wear some form of color somewhere. Um, pay attention, learn the combination. I th I'm just, I feel like a broken record from the summer course mm -hmm. video, but learn the combination. It's so important. Arms and heads correctly, especially for a company audition. They want to see people who can pick up choreography very, very quickly. That's absolutely key. And learn a ballet very, very quickly. Many times in the New York City Ballet, I had two rehearsals and went on stage. So you have to be able to adapt. And that's something they're looking for in company auditions. But between the two, there's not a lot of difference. Um, you just want to do the best you possibly can. Again, I will do a separate video, uh, but that's sort of my quick take on it. Um, okay, Anna Collar says, or Collar, might be Collar, says, how do you deal with not feeling good enough at looking at other dancers and thinking that they are much better than you? Let me tell you, Anna, I have this problem to no end. Um, especially when I was growing up, I never felt like the best one. I always felt like I was trying to, I never had good enough feet, I never had good enough extension. Um, but I figured out that my strength was my artistry. You have to find your strength. I don't have the best feet in the world. I don't have the highest extensions. But when I am dancing something or I am in, in a room when we're trying to vie for parts, I focus on what, what I can bring to the table that others might not. So you have to focus on your strengths. Sounds very, very cliche. Um, but that's really the only way to get through it. And know that no one is perfect. Everyone is different. Um, there's always going to be somebody that can do something that you can't, so that's just sort of a fact of life. Um, but I would focus on your strengths. Rather than worrying about everybody else, you can spend a lot of energy doing that where you could be working on yourself. So I have had to figure that out, especially now while I'm trying to get back from being from being sick with the thyroid thing. Um, there have been so many times when I'm like, I never can do this, and I'm just awful, and it's never going to work, and I'm totally worthless. But I remember who I am and what I've done in my resume and uh, what I can bring to the table. You've got to remember what you can bring to the table. That's that's the biggest advice I can give you. Um, and if you're a student in class with a bunch of other, other students, that can be very, very hard. Um, but really, again, try and just focus on yourself. Truly, once I, once I figured that out and stopped worrying about everybody else, it helped me tremendously. So really try and do that. It's so hard. I know how hard it is I've been there. Um, but it will really help you. Okay, um, randomnessnessness. I like that randomnessnessness. Do you ever have stage fright? If so, how do you get over it? I'll be one hundred percent honest with you. As always, I've never had stage fright. I feel much more at home on the stage than I often do in real life. Um, it's kind of like when I get out there, I can become somebody else, and I. 
am that per I'm that person and not me. Um, there's a freedom in that for me to become someone else. And I am often, again, so much more comfortable on the stage than not. Um, it's in real life that I'm, I'm much more shy. I'm much more reserved. Um, and I kind of just let it all out on stage. But um, I remember, actually, I remember when my very first Juliet, people were asking me afterwards, where did that come from? Where, where, what, where did all that emotion come from? Because I'm usually very, very uh, conserved. But I think if you do have stage fright, it's a gradual thing. You need to sort of get out there and, and maybe break it apart. What worries you? Are you worried about messing up? Are you worried about falling? Are you worried about what the audience is going to think of you? Kind of pinpoint your fear. Um, because stage fright doesn't tend to be I'm scared to go out there um, or I'm scared to be in front of people. It's usually I'm scared to be in front of people because I'm afraid to mess up, I'm afraid I'll fall, I'm afraid, you know, try and pinpoint your fear and then you can go from there. Um, you know, for me, in real life sometimes, I'll use that as an example, I often worry about what other people think of me if I'm in a situation or, you know, wherever it is. So it's not that I'm, you know, have stage fright, it's that I'm, I worry about what other people think of me. And that kind of goes back to the previous question, um, comparing myself to other people, you have to find your strengths. But pinpoint what your fear is, and I think that will help you start to get over your stage fright. Okay, um, Smiley Ballerina says, I love that name, um, which classes do you think are necessary in addition to technique and point if you want to be a professional? Pas de deux, variations, modern, jazz, etc. And what age should you start pas de deux? Um, this is a great question. I personally think variations, 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 first and foremost because that's what performing is, that's what being a professional is, is, is not just doing bar on the stage. You know, you, you have to learn how to perform, you have to learn how to be an artist, you have to learn how to portray a character, and variations class um, is a big, big part of that. That was always my favorite class at SAB when we learned different ballets, and I learned how to perform. I learned how to be that other character. Um, so I think that's so important. I was thinking about this the other day. If any of you are interested, and now this might be a bit tricky, I'm thinking of doing some variation videos where I will teach you, each video will be a different variation, and I'll break it down and you can learn along with me. They won't be anything that's copyrighted um, because obviously those kinds of issues, like nothing, nothing Balanchine, I don't think. Um, but things like Sleeping Beauty or Swan Lake or, you know, just across the board, ballets that everybody does. Um, I was thinking of sort of like the bar videos or like the class videos doing variations videos and have it be like a variations class for all of you. So let me know what you think. Um, that's still kind of in the back of my brain so please let me know about that. Um, but the other class, yes, Padida, you need to be taking Padida. Um, I was very fortunate that SAB we had two hour Padida class once a week. But here's the, the key with Padida class. You need to find a boy that is developed enough. If you are partnering a, a boy that isn't ready to be doing pas de deux, you could get seriously injured. Make sure you have, and I don't mean he has to be, you know, the best partner on the planet, Roberto Bola, you know what I mean? He has to be, but he has to be strong enough so you don't get hurt because that could really be a problem. Um, so, you know, I would say I took a pas de deux class when I was 11 at Joffrey, as I mentioned in the summer class video, but the boys were about 17. So that's, again, it I think it depends on the boy. I don't think it depends on you. It depends on how well he's trained. Not necessarily his age, but if he can really hold you up um, or keep you on your leg, even if you can't do lifts yet, do promenades, do pirouettes, that kind of thing. Gradually build up to the, the actual lifts and the partnering bit. But if he's not ready, don't partner. Do not partner with a boy that is not ready because you could really get hurt. Um, thankfully at SAB, the boys are always phenomenal, so we didn't have a problem with that. But I would say Potter is important if and only you, if and only if you have the right boy. Um, because again, otherwise it could, it could not be not good for you. You could you could end up being set back. 
Um, and then other classes, yes, I like jazz and, and modern. I think it's a good idea. I took jazz when I was younger. I was, I guess, in competitions. I took, I took it two separate ballet schools, one school that was based in jazz and one school that was based in ballet. And there were many, many times learning, especially Balanchine ballets, where I was so happy I had jazz training. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's to, to be as versatile as you can, especially nowadays. You know, back in the olden days, everything was very classical and whatever, but nowadays with, with new choreographers and that kind of thing, I would take as many different styles as you can. Um, okay, Anelia Day and, and Aniella, Aniella maybe? Again, I'm so sorry, you guys, I'm sorry. Um, what is the biggest piece of advice you could give us about being a student? And this kind of goes along with uh, Carolus Lopez's question that says, what advice do you give ballet students who want to be professional dancers? Um, again, I kind of touched on this before, but you have to focus on yourself. You cannot worry about other people. And I don't mean, you know, be a snob and be mean and every that, that kind of thing. But you can't worry about, she got this part, and when'd she get this part? And I got this, oh, I did this, and she can do that. That can get you so clogged up. Um, really focus on your strengths and your weaknesses. And uh, don't worry about other people's journeys. It's, it's not a race. It's not a race. I'm sitting here now telling you all that I never saw my career playing out this way. Some was great, some wasn't. Um, but it was not like anybody else's career. So it's not, it's, it's about the journey. It's not about who can get there the fastest, who, well, she did this by this age, so I have to do this by this age. That's, mm -hmm. that's not what it's about. So I would say really, if you want to be professional and you're a student, you have to focus on your weaknesses. Don't let your ego get in the way and say, well, I can't turn left, so I'm just not going to turn left. I mean, you have to be able to turn right and left. Um, once you get to be a professional, left kind of goes out the window a little bit because most ballets are, you turn to the right, which is great. But um, you really need to, to not let your ego get in the way, but at the same time, not worry about everybody else. That's my, my biggest piece of advice. If I had spent less time worrying about other people, it would have been a lot easier. Um, very, very easy to say and very hard to do, but that's, that's what I would, I would uh, advise you to do. And make sure you have good teachers. If you have a teacher that's kind of just giving class and not correcting and doesn't really know what they're talking about, it might be time for you to find another school. You want to have a teacher that encourages you, but at the same time corrects you. Don't let it be, again, an ego fest. Oh, well, she's wonderful. I'm not going to correct her. You want to have a teacher correct you because that's how you're going to get better. So make sure you have a good teacher as well. Um, Cheryl Tan asks, what are the standards for SAB? How, how high should your leg be, etc.? cetera? Um, along with Elena Raguin. Rag I'm sorry, you guys, you're Raguin. I was wondering if you had any tips about specific things that balance sheet style teachers look for. As far as SAB and balance sheet and all of that kind of thing, SAB is about wanting to work. As I said in the summer course video, um, they used to look at feet, they used to look at that kind of thing, but nowadays I believe, and I could be dead wrong, this is a matter of opinion, that's for the younger children. When the younger children audition, they look at their feet, they see if they're flexible, that kind of thing. But as far as the older dancers are concerned, 15, 16, 17, they want to see that you have solid technique. Um, you, there's a certain standard, but it's basically ballet standard. It's not a balancing standard. It's not an SAB standard. It's a ballet technique standard. Um, I would say have relatively good extensions. Um, obviously, if you're a girl, you can't just do 45 degrees or 90 degrees. It has to be. Arabesque can be at 90. Front and side should be, front should be 90. Side should be higher, for sure. But it's not a make or break it thing. Um, I think just a willingness to work hard and a good strong basis for technique, willing to listen, uh, following directions. Uh, you know, everybody says, what's the requirements for SAB? I, you know, there's not really a set checklist. Okay, they have to have this, 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 and this. I think it's just you have to be a good enough dancer. I think that's just, that's with any school. You know, you have to have a solid, solid enough technique. Um, as far as Balanchine style goes, if you are accepted into a Balanchine school, they will teach you. You're not expected. When I, when I went to SAB, I had absolutely no clue of the Balanchine style. I had to relearn everything, but they still took me. So that's not something you really need to worry about. Um, the biggest thing is the pirouette with the straight back leg. 
that's um, something that they only only allow. They do not allow both bent knee, both, both bent knees. But again, I was used to doing that, and I learned. So I wouldn't really worry about. Oh, I have to learn Balanchine before I go to SAB. That's not really the case. They will teach you. Um, but you have to be just a solid dancer, pretty much. Um, again, not a checklist kind of thing. Um, Emily Hollis asks, what are the best ways to turn well and practice turning without just going around and around? Or is that, or is that the best way? Um, the best thing for turns I have recently found is repetition. Just over and over, do your pirouettes, but make sure you have good form. I will do a turning video. I know I keep promising you all these videos, but I, I am going to do them, but it's just not possible to do them every single day. But I will do a turning video, and you want to make sure your preparation is solid. If your preparation is not solid, you will not be able to turn. So you want to have a nice preparation, be over the front leg, not falling back. Um, and I think with turns, again, it's repetition. There's not really a science to it. Um, something my, one of my teachers and I just did, which I love, I love her to death, Gary Whittle, big, big SAB teacher. She and I, I got an, a, a slow-mo app on my iPhone, and she would film me turning, but it would be in slow motion. So that way I could see exactly what I was doing wrong, or what was good, what wasn't good, and I cannot tell you how helpful it was, because I saw myself in slow motion, because even if you video yourself, you can't really see it. It's like one, two down, you know? If you slow-mo app it, you'll go, oh, okay, I did this wrong and that wrong. So get a slow-mo app. I got one, it's called Slow Pro. It's absolutely free on my iPhone, and she videoed me, or have your mom video you, or set up your phone and video yourself, you know, whatever it is. Slow-mo for the turns works really well. Um, and it's free. So, okay, point skate CY bunny. That's cute, point, point skate CY bunny. If you weren't doing ballet, what do you think you'd be doing right now? I can honestly say I haven't the slightest clue. Um, I had been in, you know, it was only ballet my entire life. I haven't really thought about it much. Um, probably, if I had to, okay, if I had to do, say it, it'd probably be acting. Um, because for me, that's my favorite part of of ballet, as I said before, is becoming somebody else, becoming a different character. So I'd probably say acting, maybe something in the cosmetic industry. I think you'll all be getting to see that I'm fond of the cosmetic industry. Um, but to be completely honest, I'm not entirely sure. It would probably be acting, because ballet kind of goes along that, that line. Um, so yeah, I'd say acting. Um, she also asks, what do you like best about Western ballet style, and what do you like best about the Russian ballet style? That's a really good question. Um, the Western ballet style is the jumping technique. Um, American trained dancers jump better than anybody else. They have cleaner jumps. They have faster jumps. Um, they know they point their feet every time. It's it's a balancing thing. It's not just it's not just a balancing thing, but it is. Um, but I've the you know, PNB has it too in Miami and San Francisco. American dancers are trained to jump and be fast and be clean um, and move. They know how to travel. They know how to you know cover the stage. Um, the Russians, however, the, it's their lines. Their line. Nobody beats the Russians with their lines. You know the legs and the feet and the whole thing. Um, and, you know, arms are a matter of opinion. I'm not going to say arms for one way or another because it's, it's just a different style. But for the Russians, I would say the lines. Um, and I also love in Russia how, it, not even just in Russia, but in it's that sort of style is that ballet is so appreciated over there. And ballet dancers are like, you know, they're ballet dancers rather than, oh, you're a ballet dancer. That kind of thing. I love how ballet is appreciated over there. Not necessarily that they're celebrities because that doesn't really matter, but I like how it's really, really part of their culture over in Europe and in Russia and that kind of thing, rather than just, I've had so many people ask me, oh, okay, what's your real job? So I like how it's appreciated over there, but as far as the style goes, I like the, the, their lines and, um, you know, the, the way that the, their shoes connect to their feet, just, this, just the beauty of, of the style. Okay, the final question. I hope I'm under 25 minutes. I don't know. Um, Emma Jensen asks, I don't have really pointy feet. Do you see, so do you have any point shoes that would help make my feet look better? Also, I have chronic tendonitis in my foot, and I'm going to a summer course, up, 
course coming up soon. Do you have any tips? Um, Emma, as far as your point shoe goes, first and foremost, make sure they're the right size. I just went through this problem. I was dancing in a shoe that was four sizes too narrow. Yeah, picture that. And what happens is if your shoes are not the right size, you look sickled. So my feet, for the longest time, I thought, well, I'm just sickled and, you know, the right foot kind of, it's because of the size. Once I actually went to the store and got refitted and saw that that, that was how my point shoe was supposed to fit, my feet are now, it's like, oh, they don't actually sickle. It's like, that's how it is. Um, so make sure they're the right size. Brand, that's everybody's taste. Um, you have to find a brand that you can dance in, first and foremost, not necessarily the look. Um, if there's a brand that looks really pretty, but you can't roll through or it doesn't, you can't, they don't last long or whatever it is. Um, I wouldn't say brand is a problem. You have to make sure they're the right size. Okay. So find a place that can really fit you and not just you go and try them on yourself. Make sure they fit you. And as far as the tendonitis goes, ice, ice a lot. Um, every day at the end of the day, especially for the summer course students out there, I'm so glad you asked me this. Every day at the end of the day, lay up against the wall with your feet against the wall, as I mentioned before in the stretching thing. Feet right up against the wall, basically in a uh, perpendicular, perpendicular, <laughs> wow, perpendicular to you, and keep them up there for 15 minutes. Basically, it will drain your feet um, of all of the lactic acid or the swelling, um, and your legs will feel so much better the next day. So make sure you drain your legs um, for 15 minutes every day. That might help with the tendonitis. Um, also, look at your everyday shoes. You might want to just wear tennis shoes for a while. If you're wearing heels all the time or flats all the time, for me, I actually prefer wearing heels and wedges because flats, I feel like I have nothing uh, under my feet. So look at your everyday shoes, how you're getting to, to class. Flip-flops, I know it's summer, but they really will not help your feet. Um, so maybe like a slip-on kind of sneaker or something, or a wedge, or a, a nice a solid ballet flat maybe. Um, but really make sure that your shoes are helping your feet, um, as well as the ice and, and that kind of usual thing. Um, the, the trick with tendonitis is just that it needs rest. Um, so go to your classes until it gets absolutely painful that you can't stand it anymore. Stop. If it gets to that point, that means your tendon is going to snap. I've been to that point before, and I had the doctor tell me if I hadn't stopped, it would have snapped. So unless it's excruciating and you can't even do anything, you know, be, be gentle in your classes, but ice every night and drain your feet every night. Uh, so I hope that helped you. So that's all the questions I have for today. Again, I apologize for the length and for saying your names wrong, um, but I hope this was helpful to you. If you liked this, I will be happy to do it again. I'm going to aim for once a month. Might be a little more frequent if I get a lot of questions. Also, let me know what you think about the variations type video that I'm considering. Um, as I mentioned, I will be doing all the exercise with a bar, my first bar coming up next Monday. I promise it's coming. Um, and I love you all, and I will see you next time.